Welcome to today's lecture where we're going to be looking at the lymphatic system as well as the immune system, which is chapter 27 in your textbooks. The lymphatic system is a very simple system. There's not a lot to it, which is why we add the immune system along with it because they work hand in hand. So getting started with the anatomy then, uh, when we talk about the lymph, uh, this is going to be the fluid that travels within the lymphatic system. So in the next slide, when we look at the physiology, we'll see exactly what the job of this lymph is. But again, we're going to need vessels to transport this fluid, and that's going to be the job of the lymphatic vessels. Uh, they're going to be very similar to the capillaries we see in the cardiovascular system. Um, along that lymphatic tract, we're going to have these special structures known as lymph nodes, and their job is going to be to filter out this lymph and look for any pathogens or things that don't belong, and they're going to generate an immune response if anything uh, is detected. And then along with that, we have these primary and secondary lymphatic organs, which are either going to generate these immune cells or store them. Those are going to include the bone marrow, the thymus, spleen, and the lymphocytes are the types of immune cells that uh, either are stored in them or generated by them. So we'll look at them more closely uh, at the end of the lecture. Again, looking at the physiology, like every other system of the body, it's going to maintain homeostasis. But if we look at this diagram over here, you can see we have a very simplified version of the cardiovascular system. In red, we have the arterioles. Uh, down here is our capillary bed. And then we have the venous system returning to the heart. So again, you can see the cardiovascular system is a loop. It travels in a circle, delivers oxygen, releases carbon dioxide. Along with that, if you remember, these capillaries have very thin walls. And the plasma, which is going to be mostly water, is what transports these blood cells. Um, because of the pressure and the permeability of these capillary walls, there's going to be always be this um, leaking out or kind of exchanging of the plasma with the interstitial fluid. And it's going to be the job of the lymphatic system to take up any of the fluid that escapes from the cardiovascular system and then put it back in. So we're going to have these lymphatic capillaries that work very closely with these cardiovascular capillaries. And since capillaries are all over the body around every cell, so are these lymphatic capillaries. So they're going to pick up this excess fluid, travel up these lymphatic vessels, uh, drop uh, as they pass through these lymph nodes. We're going to check them for any pathogens. And eventually, all the lymphatic vessels are going to end up back into the venous system where they're going to drop the water off into the cardiovascular system and recycle it back through the entire system. Not shown here is the urinary system, which is also going to filter the blood and get rid of excess fluid. So it's also going to work closely with the urinary system. But for now, we can just look at these two uh, and how they work together. So part of the physiology then is going to be to maintain the blood volume and pressure and to pre prevent edema. Uh, along with that, because it's a fluid and we're going to be transporting these immune cells, it's going to have a job with transportation. And when we look at the digestive system, the way the body is going to absorb uh, fats or lipids in the diet is going to be through special cells or vessels called lacteals in the um, intestines. And that's going to be what absorbs and digests the fat. Uh, carbs and proteins are going to go through the cardiovascular or through the, yeah, the cardiovascular system, whereas fats go through the lymphatic system. And as we said, it's going to be involved in the immune response. So then looking more closely at what lymphatic fluid is, it's going to be a colorless, watery fluid uh, that exists within the lymphatic vessels. So we said it's very similar to the plasma or the interstitial fluid. They're just going to have different names depending on where we find it within the body. So again, it's going to originate in that interstitial fluid, also known as extracellular fluid. So just the spaces between all the cells. And it's going to be chemically similar to blood plasma as well as that extracellular fluid. There's just going to be a larger presence of white blood cells or immune cells uh, within the lymphatic vessels. So then looking at lymphatic vessels, also known as lymphatics, this is just the collective term for the system of vessels that are going to transport that lymph back up the body and into the cardiovascular system. So as we said, they're similar to capillaries, except they're going to have larger lumens so they can hold more fluid. And it's going to be even thinner, more permeable walls. So the water is going to be able to get in much more easily. Or the um, uh, white blood cells can get in and out easily if they have to get to an area of infection. And similar to uh, the blood vessels, especially the veins, there's going to be those one-way valves. Again, because we have to get this lymph back up above the heart, we're going to need these valves to prevent the, uh, the fluid from pooling back down. Because if these valves don't work, that's when you're going to end up with edema or swelling of the uh, different body parts. 
So again, you're going to find these capillaries everywhere you find blood vessels or capillaries. So located in the intracellular spaces all throughout the body. Uh, the book says the exception is going to be the brain, spinal cord, and cornea. Um, for a long time, it was thought that the central nervous system didn't have a lymphatic system. Uh, they thought it was just the cerebral spinal fluid that kind of did the job of the lymphatic system. But definitely within the last five or ten years, uh, we're finding more and more about that there is a lymphatic system in the brain. So I really should take this out, but I included it because it was in the book. So um, I doubt you'd get that kind of specific question on any type of test or emblex, but there are lymphatics in the brain, and I assume also in the spinal cord. Cornea, um, I would assume not. The eyeball has a very kind of privileged, uh, zoned-off area of the body. It has its own like a little immune system as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if the cornea doesn't have it. I would take that at uh, their word. So then again, the big difference is the cardiovascular system travels in a loop around the body, whereas the um, lymphatic system just goes in one direction and drops it off, and that's it. So the fluid doesn't go in a loop. It just goes to its destination and is delivered back into the cardiovascular system. So as the fluid's moving up these capillaries, the vessels are going to become large, and we're going to call these lymphatic trunks. And eventually, these trunks are going to converge and form the draining lymphatic ducts which we're going to find right here uh, deep to the clavicles. So there's going to be two different ones. We have a right lymphatic duct and then a thoracic duct, which is going to be on the left side of the body. So then looking at the right lymphatic duct, it's going to drain the lymph from this purple area in the picture. So the right arm, right side of the head, and the right half of the thorax. And it's going to drain into this special vein called the right subclavian vein. So we're going to zoom in the next slide and see what the subclavian vein looks like. But the idea is these subclavian veins are going to connect into the superior vena cava and it goes right back into that cardiovascular loop. So you can imagine the right lymphatic duct is going to be responsible for 25 of the body. While the, uh, and here we can see these are the subclavian veins. This is the right one. This is the left one. This is our superior vena cava. So you can see any fluid that goes in these veins are going to end up right back into the cardiovascular system. Looking then at the other side is our thoracic duct, and this is going to drain the lymph from all the remaining parts of the body. So the entire left side of the body, as well as the right side of the uh, lower abdomen and uh, lower body. And it's going to drain its lymph into the left subclavian vein here. Um, we're going to say the thoracic duct begins at this area called the cisterna chile. So it's going to be this large kind of part of the lymphatic vessel here. So it's a lymphatic sac found between uh, the abdominal aorta and L2. So L2 is going to be right around this area. Here you can see psoas just as a um, way to figure out where you are. If you remember psoas originated, it started T12. So you can assume this is T12, L1, L2. Also, the term cisterna or cistern is going to be something that holds water. So it kind of gives you a clue of what its job is in the body. Uh, when we talk about how this lymph is moving through the vessels, this is going to be known as lymphokinesis. Again, anytime you see kinesis, as in kinesiology, we're talking about movement. And it's going to be very similar to how veins pump their blood back up because there's not a lot of pressure in the system. We're going to have to exert pressure on those vessels to push it or squeeze it through. So here where they dyed the lymphatic vessels of a mouse, and you can see it going. And like I said, it doesn't travel in a circle like blood. It's only flowing in that run one direction to those lymphatic ducts. And on average, you're going to move about three liters of lymph uh, through the cardiovascular system in a 24-hour period. Uh, this can change, though, depending on how much activity is going on. And as we said, there's going to be those special flaps or valves that prevent it from uh, exiting back out or leaking back out unnecessarily. So again, it's those external forces are going to squeeze on the lymphatic system, just like the skeletal pumps in the venous system and the respiratory pumps. So the muscles enlarge and the valves open and they pump it up. Uh, exactly the same idea as with the venous return. But lymph's going to flow intermittently into the bloodstream at those subclavian veins during each inhalation and exhalation. So just the act of breathing is going to act as a pump to get the uh, drainage to work. So exercise is going to increase lymph flow up to about 15, side, 15 times compared to rest. So one, this is because our muscles and our chest are working much more, so the pumps are working faster, 
but also because the circulation is moving uh, more rapidly, so the just fluid of the entire body is going to speed up as well. So moving on to the lymphatic organs then, we're going to separate them into either primary or secondary roles. And when we talk about primary, these are going to be what we call generative lymphatic organs, meaning they're going to generate the lymphocytes or the immune cells that are responsible uh, for uh, protection of the body. And again, remember, because these, we're talking about blood cells, they're going to originate in bone marrow. So bone marrow is going to be what produces these B cells. Um, B cells are going to be a type of lymphocyte. So you, when you see B, you should be thinking bone marrow. The other type is going to be a T cell, and these are going to be, are going to be what are made in the thymus. So we're going to have these stem cells originate in the bone marrow. They're going to enter circulation, end up in the thymus, which is located posterior to the sternum. Within the thymus, they're going to be uh, matured into a T cell. So because the immune system is kind of still being built as your child, this means the thymus is going to be the largest during early childhood and puberty. And then once you become adults, it's not as um, active, so the thymus is going to shrink. And its job, again, is to mature those undeveloped T cells. So when you see the word T cells, it doesn't stand for thymus, but it's a good little uh, reminder. T is for thymus. They're generated in the thymus organ. And if you remember, the thymus had a couple hormones, particularly thymosin and thymopoietin, and these are going to be the hormones that are uh, help or are responsible for generating uh, the maturity and differentiation of these T cells. And here you can see, once we have our T cells and B cells, they're then going to be uh, stored in the lymph nodes and some other areas of the body. So those two were the primary lymphatic organs, the bone marrow and the um, thymus. Now we're going to look at the secondary lymphatic organs whose job is to store those lymphocytes. So they're not producing any of the cells, but they are populated by them. And they're going to include the spleen, the lymph nodes, and what we call these mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues, which we'll see what we're talking about uh, in a little bit. So starting with the spleen, this is going to be the largest lymphatic organ. And it's going to be located on the left lateral rib cage between uh, ribs 9 and 10, just posterior to the stomach. So again, for reference, this is your liver here. This is your esophagus, stomach, small intestines, pancreas, if you remember from the endocrine system, and our spleen is going to be on the left upper side of the stomach. And again, it's going to store those lymphocytes and release them during an immune response. Um, I'm not sure why I have it on this slide, but one of the um, lymphocytes is going to be a macrophage. Again, macro is going to mean large, phage means large. This is a very large red blood cell, or very large white blood cell that's going to destroy old red blood cells and other harmful organisms. So it's part of the immune system's first response system, these macrophages. And the spleen can also act as a blood reservoir, so it will release extra blood into circulation during blood loss. The book doesn't get into the very specifics of how much. I can't imagine it's a whole lot, but it's probably enough just to get you a little bit further um, if it's necessary. The other secondary lymphatic organ then is going to be the lymph nodes. Uh, these are going to be very tiny bean-shaped structures that are found all over the lymphatic chain. But there are going to be gr larger groupings of it in certain areas. But you can think of lymph nodes as defense stations. So because they're going to be populated by uh, those lymphocytes, there's going to be a lot of white blood cells that are going to be able to recognize anything that doesn't belong within this fluid, uh, which was found all over the body. So they're going to be a good defense station that can clean and filter the lymph. So if they do find something that doesn't belong, those white blood cells that populate this entire area are going to take care of it uh, very soon. So they're going to contain those macrophages as well as those B cells and T cells. And because uh, they become active, if there is an uh, infection, they're going to enlarge whenever there's an attack against the body. So this is why when you are sick and you go to the doctors or you feel your own lymph nodes, particularly the ones in the cervical region, uh, the doctors are going to put their fingers here. And they're going to feel if you have any swollen lymph nodes. And if you do, it's going to be indicative that your body's fighting off a current infection. So that's a good sign. But about on average, a normal adult will have about 450 lymph nodes throughout the entire body. And then the third type uh, of secondary lymphatic organ is going to be the mucosa-associated lymph tissue, or just MALT for short. So this is going to be a collective term of small groups of lymphatic tissue all along both the respiratory and digestive tracts. So again, what do the respiratory and digestive tracts have in common? Uh, these are entry points into the body that are uh, vulnerable to uh, 
exposure to pathogens. So we're going to have extra immune uh, tissue there to help kind of stop things from getting in. So basically, they're going to protect the body from inhaled and ingested pathogens. So they can be either solitary or found in clusters. So the first type is going to be the tonsils in the oral cavity. So we have multiple types of tonsils up here. We have um, on top of the, uh, we have adenoids, uh, palatine tonsils, so on both sides of the throat and on top. Uh, within different parts of the small intestine, we have what are called pyre patches or the intestinal tonsils. Again, just in things you eat, they're going to get picked up within the small intestines. And then lastly, we have the vermiform appendix, or everyone just calls it for the appendix uh, for short. This is going to be attached to the large intestine here. So here's our small intestine in the central region. It connects to the large intestine in this area, and the appendix is going to kind of divert, divert out right here in this tiny little spot. So you can imagine, uh, you've probably known someone or you've yourself had something like your tonsils removed or your appendix removed. So back in the day, they used to think uh, these things didn't have a whole lot of function, but it does turn out that they do kind of serve uh, as part of the immune system. If you do get them taken out, uh, generally it's better than, than worse because if your uh, tonsils are always getting infected, it's not good for you. So the doctors will recommend getting them out uh, if it, things aren't getting better. But they are trying to uh, take out things like the appendix and tonsils less because usually they can just give you an antibiotic and kind of fight the infection. It's when things are chronic that they will start taking them out. So then very briefly, we're going to look at the immune system and basically the two major components that uh, compromise it. So when we talk about immunity, this is going to be the body's ability to recognize and respond to pathogens and harmful agents. So the two major types are going to be nonspecific, also known as innate immunity. And then we have a specific uh, type of immunity, also known as acquired or adaptive. So we'll take a look at what differentiates these two. But first, we'll start with the innate immunity because it's the most simple. So you can think of it as like the first line of defense against infection. So that can include things like barriers, reflexes, as well as the cellular responses like inflammation or phagocytosis. So what are we talking about? Um, when we talk about barriers, we're saying that you have your, your skin's intact and you have mucus lining those uh, entryways into the body to help catch any pathogens or block them from getting in. Reflexes will be things like coughing or vomiting, trying to get them out of the body before they can uh, set up base. And then cellular response, as we said, was inflammation. And all these things can be affected by diet, physical health, and the environment you find themselves in. So looking at barriers and reflexes, again, the skin's going to have that sweat and oil, the sebum on top, to kind of try to create an in-hospital environment for a lot of those pathogens. Uh, there's going to be these uh, enzymes called lysozymes uh, that are antibacterial. You find them in these tears and saliva. Uh, again, mucus's job is to trap those organisms and either swallow them where they're destroyed within the stomach or you spit them out. Also, we have vomiting and diarrhea, which is going to be a quick way to expel any harmful organisms. So you can imagine if you got food poisoning, your body wants to get rid of whatever you just ate as quick as possible. So if it's further up in the digestive system, you'll throw it up. If it made it further down, you'll have diarrhea to get up. But the idea is you want it out of the body. And then we also have uh, nose hairs, uh, ear hair to keep things out. Uh, coughing and sneezing also expel harmful particles from the respiratory tract as well as urine washing out the urethra to protect against any type of bladder infection. As far as cellular responses of that innate immune system, we're going to have those macrophages, those large white blood cells that are going to eat up those pathogens. Uh, some different types of cellular responses. Uh, you should know mast cells. Whenever you see mast cells, we're talking about uh, cells that are going to release chemicals that initiate inflammation. They're also going to be responsible for um, releasing histamine to cause an allergic reaction. Interferon's job, they're going to be released during uh, viral infections, so they have a defensive effect against viruses in the body. And natural killer cells are cells that attack and kill abnormal cells. So uh, a lot of times natural killer cells are going to be responsible for kind of monitoring the body for uh, cancerous types of cells. So usually people have small amounts of cancer cells in the body all the time because there's these random mutations. But these natural killer cells are able to find them, get rid of them before they ever start a problem. So that's all part of the natural uh, kind of defenses against cancer. So people that do have cancer, sometimes it might be a defect in these natural killer cells. 
And then there's also going to be many proteins in the blood plasma that help the antibodies destroy pathogens. So we'll look at antibodies as part of the acquired immune system, but they're going to have all these smaller types of uh, uh, proteins that help them uh, perform their job. So we talked about inflammation before, so just a quick run through. You can consider it like the second line of defense. So it's the body's response to injury, infection, or irritation. But the whole idea is you want to create an environment that maximizes tissue repair. So if you remember, we have the uh, swelling, redness, heat. Um, the idea is we're going to uh, dilate our blood vessels, which is causing the redness because it's bringing the blood closer to the skin. When you dilate these blood vessels, we can bring more white blood cells to the area to help fight the infection. So as we, uh, along with uh, dilating them, they're going to become more permeable to let those white blood cells leak out into the area. This is what causes the swelling. Uh, the heat is just from the excess blood in the area. And the pain is going to be what sensitizes those nociceptors because you want to kind of avoid touching the area or bringing more uh, pathogens to it. And then the second type of immunity is going to be the acquired or the adaptive immunity. You consider this the third line of defense. And this is when we're going to use those highly specialized lymphocytes that we generated uh, within the bone marrow and the thymus called the B cells and T cells. So what's going to happen is the pathogen is going to come in contact with a lymphocyte. And that lymphocyte is going to clone itself thousands of times. Uh, this is part of the reason why the lymph node starts to swell. And now it's going to create more lymphocytes that can now fight the infection. So the idea is we're creating uh, very particular types of immune cells that are perfect for fighting a specific type of pathogen. Uh, this is where these uh, lymphocytes, particularly the B cells, are going to create antibodies against that. So then looking at B cells, again, made in bone marrow for B, uh, these are going to circulate the body fluids. And so they act as like an immune surveillance system. They're going to be looking for any proteins or pathogens that don't belong. And then when they encounter that pathogen, they're going to produce antibodies. And then it's this antibodies, a very specialized weapon that is perfect for attaching itself to the invader and uh, calling attention to white blood cells and helping destroy it. Uh, this is basically what we watched in that cellular video about the, the adenovirus. Uh, it feels like a million years ago. And eventually the idea is um, after the infection is over, we're going to have what we call these memory B cells that are always going to live within the lymphatic tissues, those lymph nodes. So if you come in contact with that virus again, these memory B cells already have the weapon uh, instructions on how to create more of these antibodies. So you can take out the virus way before, or the bacteria way before um, it causes a serious problem as it did before. And this is how vaccines work. You uh, inject a little bit of a protein uh, from a pathogen, these B cells are going to cause a small immune response. These B cells are going to recognize it, create antibodies for it, and then you're going to be protected for however long because these memory B cells uh, know how to engage that pathogen. Whereas T cells, again, the book says they're going to begin as B cells or basically stem cells within the bone marrow, go to the thymus and mature into T cells. And then as they leave the thymus, they'll reside within the spleen, the lymph nodes, and other lymph tissue. Uh, they can differentiate in many different subtypes. We don't need to know these different subtypes, but the reason I have them is because uh, T cells are kind of more widely known because of their involvement with HIV. Uh, the HIV, the virus, is going to attack these T cells, and when your T cells drop to a certain uh, low level, your immune system just tanks, and this is how you end up with AIDS uh, because your immune system can't fight off all these other opportunistic diseases. So they're always measuring these T cells to make sure they're at a certain level. And then if we do have problems with our immune system, whether that's through um, congenital, congenital, you're born that way, or you acquired it as with something like HIV and AIDS, or chronic stress or diabetes, we're going to say that you're immune deficient, meaning your immune system isn't working up to the level that it should be. So it's a failure of the immune response to protect the body against pathogens. Uh, we want to avoid this, uh, obviously.